So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with me today to hear me present to you. And bear with me if I have to mute myself throughout um, during the presentation at one point. Um, the mailman does come at this time, so my dog might go a little stir crazy, but uh, it'll only be for like a minute. So if I randomly mute myself, that's why. <laughs> but <clears throat> I'm very excited to talk to you all about how we can care and nourish ourselves through nutrition, wellness, and mindfulness. A little bit about me. I'm a dietitian and a nutrition counselor, and I have had my own personal journey and history with emotional eating, tater tottering between binging and restrictive eating. This personal str struggle of mine has led me down the road towards helping mainly women, although I have helped a few men, but it's mainly women that come to me and help them build a healthy relationship with food, adding balance back into their lives and to get them feeling good about themselves. When you take care of your body and are intentional with how you nourish and care for yourself, you don't only feel better, but it gives you a new level of respect for yourself, right? Because you're caring and respecting yourself through food, through wellness, and perhaps moving your body. These are all incredible acts of self-love and care that naturally seep out into every aspect of life. And, you know, I, I see this all the time with my clients when they finally hear, heal their relationships with food and begin caring for themselves through nutrition, through moving their bodies in ways that they enjoy, by the way, that gets them energized and excited, like through dance, hiking, walking their dogs, strength training, swimming, whatever it may be, this newfound level of care is an incredible catalyst and it extends and pours out into every aspect of life, into your career, your professional life and success, overall how you show up as a person in your life, how you care for your friends, your family, your intimate relationships. And more than that, how you give to the world. Your level of giving expands so much because you've, re you've received so much from yourself. This is self-love. So here's a little summary of what I'm gonna get into further in, into this, in this presentation. And we're gonna be talking again about mindful eating, how to be present with yourself and your food, different coping mechanisms, processing, self-regulating, intuitive eating, how to intuitively eat, and the hunger scale on how that plays a tool in that, how to build a balanced plate using a very simple tool, protein and why it's so important, and last, balance. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit here about how food is um, used as a coping mechanism and a little bit about binge eating plus restrictive eating. Some of you may resonate with this, with these sentiments, and some of you may not, and that's okay. Emotional eating and unhealthy relationships to food, I believe affects more of the population than I think a lot of us realize. And even though if we feel we may not be in this category or identify with some of these things, I invite you to still listen and be open to what might resonate with you and what might not. So when we want to binge eat, it's basically we wanting uh, us wanting to escape our reality or it can be our body's way of getting ourselves back into our bodies, right? Of grounding ourselves. 
And although food may have been a very useful tool for you in the past to do these things, to cope with certain situation, situations or perhaps survive a, a stressful moment, right? It's time to let go of this old behavior because it's no longer serving you in your life now. And the first step to, to, to take with emotional eating is not to ignore it or suppress it, but acknowledge the current, this current or old coping mechanism when it does come up. This coping mechanism has helped us for years and years, right? So it's not gonna just go away. It's become a part of our brain chemistry. So it's important to not ignore it, but instead to acknowledge the old behavior. Maybe go back to a time when, when you were scared and stressed out and food might've really helped you in that situation to escape it, right? That escapism. Maybe give a little gratitude. That could sound something like, thank you for helping me get through in life. You have been an important part to my survival, but it's time to let go. It's time to let go because you are no longer serving me now. The next step to find is, um, is to find what is causing this need. What is causing the need to use food in this way? Are you feeling, again, are you feeling overwhelmed? Are you sad? Are you stressed? Anxious? Whatever it is, it's okay. Feel it. Tell yourself it's okay. Breathe. Cry. Give yourself full permission to be with yourself. You are safe to feel because somewhere along the way, you felt as though it was unsafe to be in your own body. Tell yourself you are safe. You are okay. That you've got your back and you're going to make it through. You are strong and resilient. Maybe close your eyes and give yourself a hug. Actually, everyone try that with me right now. So close your eyes, give yourself a warm hug, maybe breathe in, breathe out. Doesn't that feel nice? <laughs> or perhaps as I mentioned earlier, the desire or urgency to eat food in this moment that is not coming from you feeling hungry is actually stemming from you wanting to get yourself back into your body. Maybe you're feeling out of body and very like flighty. And if you stop and think about it, this coping me mechanism that we've created of getting ourselves back into our bodies through food is really, is actually really smart, right? You've subconsciously created a way to fulfill this need, to feel embodied, to feel safe. Because when we eat, we are suddenly flooded with all of these different sensations, right? With smells, tastes, flavors, bringing ourselves into the present moment, bringing ourselves into our body. So, wow, really like how intelligent you are for creating this coping mechanism to feel safe and grounded again. And I have a question for you all. Now that we understand what the need might be that food as a coping mechanism is fulfilling, how do you think, what are other ways that you can think of that we can meet that need? How can we get ourselves back into our bodies without depending on food? What are other tools or practices you think you can implement into your life to get yourself back to you? Anybody? I'm curious if you just shout out any if you any if, um, or type it in the chat as well. Anything that comes to mind? Go for a walk. I think that says candle. <laughs> 
Carol, oh, do I have to unmute you? Sorry. I'm not. Yeah, we were just, Gina, yes, we were just talking about Like a tree, love that. <laughs> Meditation right. activity. Beautiful. Great, okay. Love that, guys. Um, yeah, so, and also like working out, right? Physically moving our bodies, having that somatic connection, that muscle mind connection. That's an incredible tool to get ourselves back into our bodies. Maybe going for a walk, as you mentioned, or simply just like standing up and doing some jumping jacks. Maybe just like a simple neck roll or doing a stretch, yoga. Maybe just like ugh, shaking it out, gardening, or simply just like going around your house, watering your, your plant babies. You know, I think that like nature connection brings a whole nother level of grounding. Um, but it doesn't have to just be physical, as you guys mentioned, you know, it could be really anything, listening to a good song, playing with your animals, getting into nature again, meditating, right? Breath work journaling, drawing, painting, cooking, baking, really like anything creative, I feel. Um, so there are so many different ways to reconnect with ourselves. And this process of being with your body and emotions, it's gonna take time, right? And it's gonna take some practice. After all, you are unlearning several years of brain chemistry surrounding a coping mechanism that again was beneficial to you in the past, but is no longer needed. Healing your relationship with food also means you are healing a trauma response. And that takes time. And um, another thing I want to add is that it's important to stay curious and non-judgmental about eating pat patterns or behaviors that we now realize are unhealthy or getting in the way of our health, well-being, our goals. Curiosity helps us uncover that need. And now that we under understand ourselves better because we have that awareness of what the need is, from there, we can learn how to nurture and care for ourselves with greater intention. Because the need is never gonna go away, right? We have basic human needs. We're human, it's, it's a part of our human nature. But the better we can get at staying curious and uncovering these needs, the more we can discover newfound intentional ways to meet these needs. And this is just a little message I wanted to share with you all. I felt like it applied here. It's, I feel like it's also just super powerful. Orthorexia, for those of you that, that don't know, is um, an unhealthy obsession with eating healthy. So I'm just gonna read this post to you all. The difference between orthorexia and just eating foods that serve you is intention. It's the difference between eating from a place of love or from a place of fear. And to add to this, I've seen a lot of extreme thinking within the wellness community, especially over the past few years. And for those of us that are wanting to care for ourselves better, it can feel a little intimidating. It can feel like it's filled with a lot of extreme ideologies or points of views. But really, the wellness community is supposed to help people get well. So I think it's time to give ourselves and others more grace, more freedom and autonomy and you know, really step back from these extremes and all or nothing statements because wellness is really for everyone, building a mindful plate. So I'm gonna talk here about mindfulness and um, mindful eating, essentially how to be present with your food. 
the first steps to mindful eating is to allow yourself to be in your body. Our bodies cannot properly digest when we are in a state of stress. So it's imperative that we get ourselves into a parasympathetic mode, AKA rest and digest state. This could simply be, you know, just gazing down at your food and admiring it. Maybe thanking your food for the nourishment you are about to receive, or perhaps thanking the person that served you this delicious meal. Maybe taking a moment to say a little prayer or give gratitude, closing your eyes, taking a deep breath in, smelling your food, just taking a moment to be in the right here and right now and to observe. And maybe that means turning off the TV or any other sort of external stressors. And if you are eating with loved ones, maybe save any stressful topics or, or anything that is you know, too mind consuming for after you've eaten. And then as you start eating, notice any texture, aroma, flavor. Is it crunchy? Is it sweet? smooth, salty, spicy, and last, non-judgment. This is a time for loving yourself through food, a time for appreciation, compassion, and for peace. So release any old narratives and rigid rules surrounding food if they do come up. So as, we, as you can see here, we have a hunger scale. Um, the hunger scale is a useful tool with intuitive eating. Um, so when we are learning to learning how to intuitively eat. So what is hunger? Well, hunger signals your body when it's time for your next meal or snack, right? But how do we gauge how much hunger is okay? This is where a hunger scale can be a useful tool for those whose Appetite cues or fullness and satiated cues have been disrupted or hindered. Usually this ha happens from years and years of either skipping meals and, over and overeating or both. So they may have a hard time discerning whether they are hungry or full or might struggle with both. And again, it's caused by years of either ignoring their bodies or pushing their bodies past its limit with food. Um, and basically what happens is that the stomach and the brain are no longer communicating properly um, via the gut brain. So the gut brain access is basically not functioning as optimally as, op sorry, as, optimally as it should. Um, so, if you take a look at the scale, it's from goes from one to up to 10, with one being, you know, you're absolutely hungry, you're at your absolute hungriest, you're maybe feeling lightheaded, maybe you're like getting just really stressed out. You basically need food like right now. Five is a little more neutral. You're not hungry, but you're not feeling full either. And 10 being really uncomfortably full, like you could not eat another bite. So basically when utilizing this hunger scale, I'd recommend grabbing a snack or a meal at about a three or a four. So right here. Uh, so basically when you're feeling moderately hungry and to stop eating at around a seven, and as you can see written on the hunger scale image, seven, you're feeling, you know, completely set. You're not, um, you are feeling completely satisfied and you know that you can go hours without eating. Like you're going to be full for a few hours. So this tool is really helpful as it helps you discern when it's time for your body to seek nourishment as well as let you know when you've given your body what it needs and are feeling satisfied. One really important thing I want to add is 
you really don't ever want to get to that place where you feel hangry, right? Hungry and angry. I think we've all been there. <laughs> but if we are intentionally getting ourselves to that hangry, starvation mode, stressed out place, if it's intentional and you, you do it repeatedly, I want you to gently ask yourself, would you feed a child that way? Would you tell a child, no, you need to lose weight, so you're skipping this meal? Or to the other side of that, maybe you tend to overindulge and eat past your limits. And from that sense, would you tell a child, I feel like you overeat here, so you might as well keep going until you really don't feel good. These questions and prompts may sound a bit harsh, but the reality is, is that we can be our biggest inner bullies sometimes, especially when it comes to food. But if you think about it, that's not really you. Those aren't really your voices, your true thought. Negative self-talk or harsh inner dialogue are in fact the voices of other people. They are voices of the people around you that you've internalized over your lifespan. Because you didn't come into this life speaking to yourself like that, right? So next time you feel like you may, might want to restrict or overeat, ask yourself, would you feed a child that way? And really, that's you asking you, would I feed my inner child that way? I invite you right now to take a moment and visualize yourself at maybe eight or 10 years old. Maybe sit back, drop your shoulders, relax, and close your eyes. Visualize him or her now. What does he or she look like? What are they wearing? How do they act? What's their personality like? Usually when I visualize my younger self, I feel this overwhelming need for protection. I wanna protect her. I want her to know she is loved. I want to support her. I want to take care of her and to nourish her. Know that your inner child is you. They are a part of you. They are you and they're perfect because you're perfect. You can open your eyes now if you'd like, or you can just keep listening along. Now, I wouldn't be a good Caritas coach if I didn't tie in some of the philosophies and writings into this presentation, right? So. I'm going to read to you all one of my favorite writings from the book, Caritas Coaching, A Journey Toward Transpersonal Caring for Informed Moral Action in Healthcare. And it's written by um, Heron, sorry, gosh, Sarah Horton Deutsch and Jan Anderson. And this particular passage um, in the book was written by Jill Garabed Kruska. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And I'm going to be paraphrasing a bit as the passage was written mainly about how connecting with self 
allows us to connect with others and how caring for those around us connects ourselves to our own humanity. But I think it also applies a lot to what we've discussed so far here um, today. And again, it's one of my favorite passages from the Caritas coaching books. It's written so beautifully and it, oh my gosh, it touches my soul every time I read it. So here we go. As children, human beings are resilient and open, inclusive and loving. But after experiencing pain, shame, and hurt, we often build, build walls and wear masks. This seems to reduce our chances of being hurt, but in reality, creates a barrier that disguises our beautiful humanity and leaves us feeling isolated and disconnected. Part of being vulnerable means redefining personal boundaries. To truly know myself and to create a compassionate essence, I had to allow myself to become vulnerable and transparent. Being vulnerable may seem frightening at first, but as we begin to peel back the layers, we provide a gift to ourselves and to those we encounter. It is through this shedding of layers that we begin to remove the barriers that cause perceived separation and impair us in our ability to connect with our own humanity. It was only after I accepted my own vulnerability as a coach that I was able to truly pr practice the 10 Caritas processes. Whew, that one gets me every time. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to be transitioning into more of a cerebral learning part of the presentation. I'm going to be giving you some helpful nutritional tools and resources that are practical and here for you to start using today and beyond. So first of all, we're going to learn how to build a balanced plate. This is a very useful tool for creating balance with your meals and snacks. And it's very simple and easy, and you can do it anywhere. And the only tool you need is your hand. It's actually pretty personalized as your hand is hopefully, <laughs> for most of us, proportional to our bodies. And so it's really providing us with our own unique template to building the four components of a meal. So first off, so kind of if you want to just visualize, you have like a plate in front of you and you're building it along with me. So first we have protein. So we want to ensure that we're getting at least five ounces or 30 grams of protein per meal. I just want to preface that in um, for using our hands, protein, this isn't always going to be five ounces. So take this with a grain of salt with protein, but for the rest of these uh, macronutrients, they, it does apply. It's just protein. This is a little, in my opinion, outdated and we need more protein than this. So, because sometimes this will be 30 grams of protein, but not always. So what I would recommend is actually buying a scale and weighing your protein in the beginning to see what five ounces or 30 grams looks like. So you get a feel for it and then you can just kind of visualize it that way. And that'll just come with time. So five ounces, 30 grams, get a feel for what that looks like with a, um, a scale. Um, and like I said, it, sometimes it will be this much, but not always, usually it's a little bit more. Um, and protein sources are, of course, you know, lean beef, fish, chicken, turkey, seafood, eggs, cottage cheese, tofu, tempeh. Um, I really like Skyr or Greek yogurt. Those, those yogurts just have more protein in them. Um, and then number two, vegetables. So for women, one fist, for men, two fists. However, 
I really don't think you can go overboard <laughs> with non-starchy veg veggies. So for women, you know, you can have a fist or more, but I would say minimum per meal, at least a fist. Um, and, you know, examples of some non-starchy vegetables are broccoli, any leafy green, asparagus, and, you know, any, any leafy green. So spinach, kale, arugula, dandelion greens, rainbow chard, lettuce, things like that. So that's number two. So if you imagine you have a plate, you have your protein, now you have your non-starchy veggies. And then number three are carbohydrates. So that's gonna be basically, oh, it's always hard to show this one, but if you imagine your hand like this, your carbs would fit in here like that. And it'd be about one cupped hand for women and two cups for men. And uh, carbohydrates are going to be in this category, any starchy vegetable. So, you know, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, any whole grain, oats, um, any beans or legume, and then fruits are also in this category. And then last but not least fats. So here you can see depicted women, one thumb, and then two, <laughs> sorry, men, two thumbs. Um, and you know, that's going to be any oil, nuts, butters, seeds, things like that. Now this isn't meant to be followed rigidly, but instead think of this as a tool that'll help you bring balance to your meals as sort of, you know, a loose template. And what's more important for you to remember is that it's essential that we have a protein source, a fat source, and a carbohydrate source at every meal and snack. This is gonna help us get essential fatty acids and the amino acids that we need. It's gonna help provide our bodies with antioxidants and phytochemicals from fruits and vegetables. And it's gonna provide us with complex carbohydrates so that we're getting enough fiber and sustained energy. Fiber is so important for keeping things moving. And our bodies really need that because stagnation leads to disease and inflammation. Fiber also is really great at reducing our toxic load. It helps get rid of any toxins, waste products, excess cholesterol, hormones. If we don't get enough fiber, our bodies can't properly, they cannot properly move everything out of the body. So yeah, if we don't get enough cholesterol, things aren't gonna be moving and that will lead to inflammation. Again, high cholesterol, hormonal imbalances and gut health issues because fiber feeds our gut microbiome. So we really wanna make sure each meal has all of these component, components. Because let's say if we eat carbs alone, especially like a simple carbohydrate source, we aren't gonna get any essential fatty acids. We're not really gonna get any amino acids. Um, and we probably won't have much sustained energy because we're going to have, we're probably going to get a short, shortly after consuming it, a blood glucose spike, and then following that, a dip, causing a crash or just like low energy. And let's say to the other side of that, we eat protein by itself. We'll probably have a blood sugar dip, right? Because we're not getting much of an energy source there. So regulating our blood glucose levels is not something that we should only think about when there's diabetes. Healthy blood glucose levels are imperative for good health and you can ensure that you're supporting yourself in this way by having balanced meals and snacks. It's as simple as that. And this diagram here is just giving you um, more in depth of a breakdown of the different categories. So here you have protein, fat, I believe is, yeah, all the way down here. <laughs> I don't know why it's under extras, to be honest, but it's right here. Beans, grains, fruits, and veggies, these are all 
in the carbohydrate category, and then nuts is considered more of a fat. And by the way, if you want any of these handouts or anything in this presentation at all, just I believe you could probably let Julie know um, and I will send them your way. So, so far we've gone over how to create balanced meals, right? And why each macronutrient, AKA fat, carbohydrates and protein is important. But I wanna give protein a little extra love and attention because it's probably one of the most undervalued and under eaten macronutrient that I see. We simply do best mentally, physically, and body composition muscle-wise when we're eating enough protein. Eating protein forward and eating enough throughout the day is so important. We need, we absolutely need protein to preserve our precious muscle tissue as we age. When we'll be needing it the most, right? It's gonna help protect ourselves long-term and set us up for quality years later in life. It's imperative that we start prioritizing, maintaining the current muscle that we have on our bodies now, as well as encourage new muscle growth as much as we can. Not only this, but the amino acids in the protein that we are consuming are important for cognitive health and every single metabolic function in the body. Protein also plays a big role with cravings. And as someone who used to have the worst cravings ever <laughs> and major sweet tooth, the one thing that helps me the most was eating a very filling and high protein breakfast. I used to skip breakfast out of guilt, thinking somehow it was gonna help me reach my goals. But I found that if I didn't eat breakfast, I became ravenous, you know, moody and stressed for the rest of the day. And I had a hard time feeling full no matter what I did. And then by the time night came around, I had an intense urge to eat something sweet and definitely not in mod moderation. <laughs> then, and then I learned about protein prioritization and I started implementing that more in my life. Um, also something I wanted to add is really fascinating. And it's, uh, I learned that animals will actually feed through instinct until their protein requirements are met. Meaning we will look for protein throughout the day if our protein needs are not met. Hi, like, hello, cravings, right? Um, and a fun fact in traditional Chinese medicine, meat and a few high protein foods that are more so vegetarian, such as like dairy and legumes, are actually described as a sweet note. They are, they are categorized as a sweeter flavor. And that makes a lot of sense, right? As to why we have such intense sweet cravings later in the day, if our protein needs, needs are not met early on. It's our body's way of basically being like, hey, I didn't get enough protein today. Can we please get some? So again, I really recommend 30 grams of protein minimum at every meal, especially at breakfast. This is really going to set you up for the rest of the day. Oh, and I'm giving you your five minute warning. Okay. And we're actually most metabolically primed to di digest and absorb protein at breakfast. So it's really the golden time to ensure that you're getting that 30 grams minimum of protein. So real quick to summarize the last two slides, um, and I'm making sure that all of my meals and snacks are balanced with fat, carbs, protein. I am, um, each meal is protein forward with at least 30 grams of protein per meal, especially at breakfast. 
when I'm doing these things, my mood, my energy and appetite are regulated for the rest of the day. And then this is my very last slide. So as with anything, balance is the spice of life, right? <laughs> if you take anything from this presentation, I want you to remember that the goal is to nourish your body and care for yourself in a way that's gonna make you feel your best. But the, to the other side of that coin, don't limit yourself from the world and its experiences. So a good measurement to follow that I really like is the 80-20. So maybe that looks like Monday through Friday, you know, you're cooking your own meals, you're really, you're prioritizing moving your body in some way. Um, and then Saturday night, you're getting drinks and having tapas with friends, right? Or eating some cake or cookie or pizza, hopefully after a balanced meal and on, it, on its own, right? <laughs> but because this is not about restriction and being rigid, it's about building healthy patterns with your food that's realistic to your lifestyle and your food preferences. And about giving yourself grace. Allow yourself to be human, to have that trial and error. We're all learning, yet work towards our goals that we want, working towards the goals that we want to achieve most in life that matter most to you. By implementing these sustainable, healthy lifestyle habits, that we've spoken about here today, you're going to create a healthier and well-balanced life. Again, thank you so much for your time and let food be thy medicine. <laughs> and that's all. Let me see if I can stop sharing. Oh, I'm <laughs> creative and so contributing and informative i love it thank you thanks i try to tie in both you know the information and then the emotional aspect so yeah glad you guys liked it is there any oh closing ceremony right i'll let you take over <laughs> oh i think just to you know yes please do put some questions in the in the chat but also are you you are accepting private clients you still have space for private clients do you Just yeah so, no okay so people know so so reach out to us and we can share Alma's details her details are also on the website under the care testing and connections at the moment so thank you and I'll pass over to Carol thank you thank you so creative and so informative just like such good tips we all forget <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a wise it's wisdom too thank you Thank you, Gigi. I truly enjoyed the, your talk. I took notes. <laughs> oh, all good. Yes. I, I mean, it was just, it was things that I had never, I never thought about before. Yeah. Um, that you, you know, that it's part of your, this coping is part of your brain chemistry. Never mm -hmm. thought of that. It is, and it's an unlearning. Uh, mm -hmm. Very interesting topics. And, and, the, and the idea of getting yourself settled down before you eat mm. you know, with the parasympathetic, try to get yourself into that digestive mm -hmm. um, mode. Yeah. And I want, I want that page 57. I, I did enjoy you reading that. Yeah, I love, oh my gosh, such a good book. All the mm -hmm. personal stories. I, I think I cried reading 90% of it. <laughs> <laughs> And it seemed to come from your own experience, Alma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, little bits and pieces of it. <laughs> yeah, I think that made it come across because it was, wasn't just from a book. It was from your own learning. Yeah, absolutely. We have a couple of minutes. Does anybody have a question or is there something they'd like to comment for Alma? Alma, could I ask you a question? I was yeah. typing it. 
I just wondered, you know, you come from a family of such caring people. Um, it, it's, it's sort of in the family. But can you tell me when you knew that you were going to follow that path too? Because you did a beautiful job today. I just wondered when you knew. Oh, man. Um, of like wanting to be a Caritas coach or... Could you give more information <laughs> on your question? Well, just Sorry. when did you know you, you were going to be a helper? You know, like, oh, I see. yeah, when I was young, I knew uh, when I was a child, I knew um, people used to ask me, you know, uh, what do you want when you grow up, Marilyn? And I would say, oh, I want to have 169 children. And people used to tell <laughs> me, you can't do that. That's too many children. But you know what? I did become a teacher and I had more than 169 children. So I just wondered wow. what, what sort of drew you? Yeah. So I think, I mean, I couldn't really tell you, honestly. I think it's like I've, I was always that friend that played the mediator. Like I always wanted to help problem solve. And I was always the person that people came to. So I just naturally loved like hearing people out and helping them and being genuine and vulnerable. I just, I loved that so much. And then I just like naturally found nutrition very interesting. I loved learning about it for my own well-being and health. And then, so I just kind of like put, pushed them together. Right. So that was like the nutrition aspect and then the counselor aspect. And so now I'm a nutrition counselor. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's like how I can think to answer it best, but it's kind of interesting when you when you think about things because you're like, why am I the way I am? <laughs> you know, so I think that's why. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions? All right. Well, we've come to the end of our hour. And I do thank you, Alma. And I uh, so appreciated your talk. And I thank you, Dr. Jeanette, for the opening as we come together and you know to try to uh, learn from one another. And uh, it uh, makes for this. That's why I enjoy this uh, this Caritas meeting, healing connection so much. All right, I'm going to end with a just a, a, a very. No, I just wanted to comment on the synchrony of the hands with Jeanette opening with the hands and Alma's use of the hands in terms of her imagery. I just thought it was very significant. And and, and our and our logo is a lotus. And exactly right. There's a lot of connections there. It was perfect. It was perfect opening. Yes. Well, we did. All right. I just I'm like a bull in a china shop. I didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> wanting to comment, but I have this um, this closing, and it's again uh, because of your topic, you you integrated a little bit of the spirituality, you know, uh, nutrition, its facts, and the soul. I wanted to do this. It includes it includes the body. So the first position I, I want you to do it with me is to put your hands on your hips. That's a, a position of, of waiting, because I, I think that after hearing your presentation, that it'll take a while to really integrate it into our minds and our hearts and how we proceed. And then I want you to put your hands up and allow what learning we have been given today that we've been graced with to come into our being, to wash over us. And I want you to put your hands on your heart and accept what, what has been given to us, the learning that has come to us so uh, graciously today, that it will, it will be um, helpful to us and will change us to be, uh, have more well-being in our life. And then just put your arms out and I, it's a, just a, uh, a symbol of attending to what we've learned. What are we going to do with this? Go forward with it. And that's the, the ending meditation. 
And I, I thank you. I thank you all. And I guess we, we won't have a meeting in July, but we'll be back in uh, in August. And I Namaste. Hope, I hope to see you all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Namaste. We will, we will be putting this up on our social media, on Facebook and so forth. So if you want to revisit, revisit, please do. Mm -hmm. Much love. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. God bless. Love from Italy. Yeah. <laughs> right.